enjoying the ride? How many of you? Do you um, if you if you went here last week, uh, I want to ask you just to to listen to um, last week's message. I really felt God asking me to to put down two bricks, which I believe are important for us. And the one is structure, and the, and the other one today I'm going to talk about leadership. And um, so to give, to give you an overview, um, I'm going to look at. I believe God is raising a, a new breed of leader. I'm going to talk about that, and then I'm going to then I'm going to answer the question: Is why is a new breed of leader needed, and what does that require from us as those who follow and those who lead? And we all fall into both categories: leading and following. And then we're going to look at some passages that give us something of a biblical picture, and then we're going to land it with. How can, what can I and what can you do to be part of what God is doing? Um, and hopefully it makes sense. So I'll try and keep it moving. Um, so I believe God is raising up a, a new breed of leader. I believe that God is raising up leaders that are radically word-based. Leaders that are builders of covenantal relationships. Leaders who have one king. And that king is Jesus, no other king. Leaders who are being discipled while discipling others. They're being led while leading. I believe the new breed of leader that God is raising up are those who have radically given themselves to submission. Radically, God's already spoken to us about that this morning already uh, in the worship. Just about bowing the knee. When we bow the knee, the authority of God comes and is there. I believe the new breed of leader that God is bringing and raising up are those who understand authority. Most people don't understand how authority works. I believe the new breed of leader that God is raising up are those who are secure, shaking off the insecurities that we all uh, struggle with. Those who are confident. And their confidence and their ability is not in their own ability, but in the power and the demonstration of the Spirit that can flow and will flow through them. I believe the type of leader that God is raising up this new breed are those who have their eyes on the groom while attending the bride. They have their eyes on the groom, Jesus, while they're looking after the bride. And I believe the new breed of leader that God is raising up has a new heart, a different heart. I believe that the leaders that God is raising up are those who are skilled with the left and the right. I believe the days of having uh, uh, deficiencies, strength, uh, weaknesses, there's a new breed of leaders who's like, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, allow every valley to be built up and every hill to be brought down. There's going to be a, gonna be something of a skill with the left and the right, working on our on our weaknesses. And I believe the new leaders that God is raising up are those who are constantly being conformed into the image of Christ. You can see if you watch their life, there's a journey here, there's a maturity journey here. There's no plateau or stagnancy. And so today I want to invite you to be part of what I believe is this new breed of leader that God is raising up. Why is this new breed of leader necessary? Well, it's obvious. There's an obvious leadership crisis in our world. There's a leadership crisis in our world. The fruit of bad leadership is everywhere for us to see. And do you think the answers are going to come through politicians? <laughs> through businesses, maybe. I do think that God has given us some answers through His Word. That there's a type of leadership that God wants us, you and me, to display out there in every sphere. And we are to be part of that solution. And that's why I believe it is absolutely necessary that we give ourselves to this becoming this new type of leader. And we all have different spheres of our life, spheres of influence. Leadership is influence. Pretty much. And we all have different spheres of influence. I, in a sense, I lead myself. 
I lead in my, in my family sphere and I lead in my, in a sense, in the, with the people that I work with. So there's, there's kind of leadership things that are just by osmosis, just by being who I am. And I, I need to be a boss to display some kind of biblical ethic and biblical way and biblical leadership. I need to be the boss. Actually just be being there, there's something of an influence. But then the, the sphere that becomes very important when we're given an official leadership role. If you are leading in any sphere, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a boss, no matter where you are, if you're, le- if you're leading like that, it is absolutely critical that we get God's heart for leadership so that we display something of the solution because the bad news is everywhere. We've been let down in, on every side. The lack of trust of leadership is at an all-time high. 30 executives were asked the question, who are the top three people that you trust? And in the top answers, mother was the top, father, the second, siblings, and friends. Those were the people that trust most. They were then asked, um, who's the person, these are top of years executives, who's the person who has the most influence in your well-being, in your future, and in your happiness. Every single one of them, you're the top three, was the, was the question. Every single one of them put one person down, their boss. Then they were asked, how come the person you spend most time with, more than your mother, your father, is the least trustful? Something's wrong. <laughs> and then the bosses were asked how much do their people trust them? And they thought 30% higher than what their people thought. And so my point of it is simply this there's a leadership problem, there's a disconnect, there's a trust problem in the leadership that we see around the place. We have corruption, which has destroyed it, greed. We've got wars over men's and people's ambition and greed. We have selfish gain. There's, there's, on the one hand, you have leaders who are for the betterment of the people. On the other hand, you have leaders who are just up for their own gain. These are some of the problems that have given us this mistrust. And so the evidence is everywhere. There's abuse of power. Abuse of leadership. We have to stand against abuse of leadership in the home, in the church, in business. It is our duty and our identity to lead in this new way that God wants us, that God is raising up for the sake of being a solution to what God wants to do in the in our city, in our, in our, in our country. I mean, you with me? I'm ready on number three. What does that require? We fly. <laughs> now, what does that require? So it requires stuff of us, those who lead and those who are following. And I want to just say this, that we all follow and we all lead. Every single one of us are to be following and leading. And so as a person who leads, and as leaders, it requires us to think differently. We need to move away from that. It's a, my, my leadership role is about me. Move away from that, it's about me, to it's about us. We need to move away from um, the idea of the position versus role and function. When you think position, I'm given this position for my, for my good. When you think function and role, you think like, there's a whole thing happening here, and I'm one cog in the whole thing. And I play my part, just like everyone. My part happens to be I'm leading this team, and everyone plays their, their part. And so I just play my part. And that's the way we need to look at how, what God's doing. God's on a program. God's, God's 
if we step back, God has got an eternal plan, and we get to be part of it. We get to be a cog in that, in that machine, if you like, of what God is doing through the ages. And that's a different mindset that we have to take on. We have to go move away from managing and move towards stewarding. When we manage, we drive people. When we steward, we lead people. When we manage, um, the task is important. When we steward, the, the mission is one. Everyone understands the mission. Uh, we, we need to move away from a one man leadership model to team model. God's way is a team. There's not much done with a one man show in the Bible. Leadership is influence for good. But these are some of the ways we have to change how we think if we're going to lead, to lead differently. And, that, and then, secondly, we need a new attitude. We need, like I was saying, we need this high view of what a high calling it is to be involved in, in leading. There's such a resistance for people to put their hand up to, to, to lead anything. It's because leaders are always getting hammered because there's always problems. And so now people are like, actually, somebody else can do it. I'm like this resistance. Actually, it's the highest calling. It's an absolute privilege to play a role and model something of what Jesus wants to see happen right throughout. How else is our, are our politicians going to have find a better way? Not without us. It's an absolute privilege to model something of heart and ways and how to lead. It's an absolute privilege. And when we start to think and our attitude towards leadership is totally different, it changes everything. It's a privilege versus a sacrifice mentality. When, we, when it's a privilege, we love it and we're full of passion. When it's a sacrifice, it's a duty and a cost. I love the way Solomon, if you read the narrative of Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 3, it says that Solomon loved God. Leaders' attitude is as a love for God, and out of that, we do what he asks us to do. And then it says there, then we listen to his prayer. God comes, so Solomon loves God. Second thing that happens, God comes and says, what do you want? Ask me anything, I'll give it to you. And we know, and then Solomon, if you read his prayer, then you see he's so humble, and he has such a high view of leading God's people. He has such a high view. And so he says, he, he prays so humbly and says, it's, it's such a, you're great people because it's a reflection of who you are. And so there's this humility that, that we see in him. So we have to have, so what does it require of us as leaders? We have to have a new way of thinking and a completely new attitude towards leading and leaders. What about, how do we follow? How do I follow leaders? Number one, we need a new view of leaders. How we see leadership. Leadership are there to help and add value. Leaders are there to support. To they the ones that you can trust most. They are to open doors, to bring food, fruitfulness, and to coach us. Now that's a hard word, coaching. Right? Leaders are there to coach you. I'm busy training for, for a cycling race. And I'm trying to coach myself. It's a, it's a hard job to, when you don't feel like pushing harder, to like, you can hear your coach voice, someone in your ears just saying, no, you can just keep, keep the power on, you can do it to the top of that hill. Coaching is not easy. You take people beyond where they want to go. That's when the moaning comes up. And that's what leaders are there for. So there's all the good, the support and love and open the doors and help you. But there's also the, the coach, Leader, leaders are coaching. And so we have to change how we view leaders, leaders. We have to overcome our authority issues. Now this is how it works. The, how, the way that we think is everything that we've experienced in our life before stored in, stored in our database here. So if we've ever been hurt by anyone who's led us, it's all there. It's just there. You don't even realize that it's there. And that's how you, whenever a situation arrives, your brain operates faster than you think and you sum things up straight away. 
and you actually reacting before you even have thought about it, you're reacting. You don't even know it. How many of you have recognized issues in somebody else? Come on, be honest. All of us. We all can see issues in everyone else, but oh my word, I blind our head of our own issues. Alright? And let's just get it out there. We all have issues. Okay, even me. Oh, I pay them for that. Right. And so we have to, I mean, look at this. This is this to me just like undoes me. First Peter chapter 2, verse 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors who sent him, who are sent by him to punish those who be evil and praise those who be good. For if this is the will of God, to submit. I'm just to now some of you guys are freaking out now. Because we, our society does conditional submission. That's it. We just got to be real with where we're at. That's what we do. We do conditional. I will go along with this so long as, and we've got our little points of where we check out. You know? So it says here, this is the will of God, that by doing good, we should put, put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with respect, with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. So what he's saying here is, the person who is over you, when they're good, be subject to them, and when they're not a good boss, be subject to them. So this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, are you doing it? You're mindful of God. One endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. Then he goes on his more but that freaks me out. Because it really just says, actually doesn't matter who's leading and how they're leading. <laughs> but actually my attitude and my heart towards that, because just in other places it says in Hebrews 13, it says, all authority is God given. Now that just messes with me again. Because they're terrible leaders who should never be given any leadership, and I don't know what to do with that. I'm just being honest. But I'm required to give my heart, submit. Right? Now, now there is a difference between submit and obey. Okay? Submit is to arrange oneself underneath. All right? So all of you guys who are campaigners for causes. You can arrange yourself underneath without breaking the law. Right? That, that's my understanding at least. Let me move on, I'm going to get in trouble. And now we are number four. Did you see how good you did that? <laughs> Let me give you some passages that I think are a model. Alright? Jethro, um, when Jethro comes to Moses, so this is uh, Deuteronomy chapter 1, if you have your Bibles, it'll be great if you can go there. I want to just pick out a few verses. I want to give you a little bit of a pattern and a model of what does this look like. So it says here, at that time, he's talking about what happened. And he says, at that time, I said, I'm not able to bear this weight. So now there's millions of people that Moses is leading. The demand is too much for him. And he says, because the Lord has multiplied you. And then he jumped to verse 12. So it's generally 1.12. How can I bear by myself the weight of the burden of you and your strife? Choose for your tribes wise, understanding, experienced men who, will, who I will appoint them as your heads. Then he says, So I took the heads of your tribes, wise, experienced men, sent them over you as commanders of thousands, commanders of hundreds, commanders of fifties, commanders of tens, and officers throughout the tribes. I charge. And I charged your 
judges at that time and said, Here, the cases between your brothers, judge righteously between a man and his brother or an alien who is with him. You shall not be partial in judgment, for you shall hear the, the small and the great alike, and you shall be not be intimidated by everyone, for the judgment is the Lord's. And any case that is too hard for me, call me. So this is what I see. Yeah, right? So picture number one. This is how we multiply ourselves, right? So what Moses did, he says, like, he's only one big question, answering all the questions. Like, how do we apply the law? Everyone's coming with questions. And he says, this is how I multiply myself. And if you look at, at Numbers 18, I thought it was the drive I had, like the music. If you look at Numbers 18, it says that God took the spirit that was on Moses and he put it on the 70, right? So, same spirit. So, God wants to multiply wherever, whatever sphere that we're in, and where, what he had. This is the way that God wants to multiply leadership. He wants to. He, so, there's, and then he, he says, you choose an point, you give clear, detailed instructions, you train, and he says in verse 18, you, I commanded them everything that they should do, and then you give them appropriate authority, you support them, when they need help, they come and they ask for it. So this is a picture of many people same part, right? Galatians chapter 2, another picture. This is Paul. And he's writing to the Galatians and he's telling what happens. He says, then for, after 14 years I went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. And I went up because of a revelation sent me. Uh, revelation and set before them the, uh, the gospel that I proclaimed among the Gentiles in order to make sure that I was not running or had run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of oh, because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ, so that they might bring us into slavery. To them, we did not yield in submission, even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. He goes on and he says, and they, um, he said, those who seemed influential added nothing to his message. And when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, as Peter had been trusted to the gospel to the circumcised, the Jews and the Greeks, it says they, they, when James, Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given me, they gave me the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and myself. Um, so, what is the picture? We see Paul gets a divine revelation and task from God. He's, he's instructed from God, yet he still goes and he submits his message to those who seem to be leaders. And he works it out. We see he goes up after three years and he goes up again after 14 years and he works it out. And he, we see the picture is we have two areas of ministry to the Jews and to the Gentiles. And you see how it's worked out is that um, James, Peter, and John, those who seem to be leaders, recognized the grace that God had entrusted over them. And they perceived, the other word it uses, they perceived the grace. Remember the, the, the picture of the body. Christ is the head. Remember, remember I put that thing up uh, last week. Christ is the head. The body is the is administration and leadership. Uh, giving, serving, one leg is teaching, other leg is encouraging. And so all these gifts work together. And the prophetic word God gave us is that the spine is the leadership. The spine in the torso is the leadership. The, the, the communication comes from the head Jesus through the spine to every part, to the every every little part of the body. It's got nerve endings and so that the messages can go. And so we see this. So how does God God calls leaders and people in the church recognize and perceive that God is called, and then they are given the hand of fellowship. 
That literally means in a big meeting of the whole church, they came up to the front and they publicly endorsed their teaching. That's, that's what happened there. They were given Barnabas and Paul, given the hand of fellowship. That means that they publicly said, these guys, we want you to trust how they what they teach. Because they've actually come and they've submitted their doctrine through us. And then one last picture of what this looks like. We see Luke chapter 9. Jesus sends out the 12. He gives them a task. And he tells and he says he gives them authority and power. Then in the next chapter, Luke chapter 10, he sends out the 72. He gives them detailed instructions. He says, go do this. Go ahead of me. I'm coming into the city, into the, these towns. Go ahead of me. He tells them exactly. He says, look for the man of peace. And what happens if you don't find the man of peace? And then he says, and then, then he gives them power and authority. Right? And so the picture here is that there's a task given, instructions given, and authority follows those those, those instructions. We often, in ministry and in church, in different ministries in church, we often go out of this order and want God to come and give us power and authority. Actually, we're not, we're not under the head, under the leaders God's put in, in your life. So, what can I do in part of this? It's a great question. I'm great. I'm thankful you asked. It's the last of my points. <laughs> Number one, deal with the brokenness of the past. I don't think there's a person in the room who hasn't been hurt by a leader. I don't think there's a person in the room whose father or father figure hasn't led them well, abuse, or whatever. Most of us have had some kind of leadership experience where we've been hurt. And while we this is what God requires of us. God requires of us to give our whole heart. God requires of us to actually follow wholeheartedly. Man, we all find following God wholeheartedly. But man, it's hard to follow people. And so long as we are Half resisting because we're, we're keeping ourselves safe. We're not giving ourselves what God wants to give us. The model that God wants to show the world is an absolute oneness, relational strength. Now, I'm not saying it's our fault if you've been hurt and you're resistant. It's natural. Every one of us is like that. What I am saying is, actually, you've got to get over that stuff that happened to us in the past. You've got to get over all the poor leadership models. You've got to fix our eyes. And with hope, follow people with an open heart. And if we don't do that, we're going to be going at 80%. Yeah. And that's not okay because the world out there needs to see 100%. And are you going to get hurt? Yes, you're still going to get hurt. I hope not. Am I still going to let you down? Yes, I'm going to let you down. I'm not perfect. And that's not what God All we can do is build trust. All we can do is build trust. Let me put it like this. Trust is the glue that the capacity to do things together rests on. Trust is the glue that the capacity to do stuff together rests on. When we do things together, the world changes. God has used individuals a bit, but generally God uses people and a team and a, and a, and a nation and a family. And a, when we do stuff together, the world takes notice. Because the world doesn't know how to do stuff without it becoming dysfunctional. Right? So, the premise is this. Think with me. We're all broken. Agreed? We're all broken. All right? We have sin's scar and our past and all our unhelpful understandings of how things should be. We, have, we all have that. We are being conformed into the image of Christ, so we're being set free. 
we're on this trajectory of be becoming more and more like Christ. No hope of ever experiencing a God type of leadership. How much more do they need? Something of a model. And it might just be you with other mothers. It might just be you with your running group or your cycling group or your people you work with. They need a picture of hope. That actually there's a way. There, there, there is a way that leadership can be a success. And so I think building trust is a practical way that every single one of us can do. We can build trust to those who lead us. We can build trust to those who we lead. So, so trust is the glue that helps us stay together and do stuff together. Trust is the currency in relationships. So I build a bank account with people. Because later on, there's a withdrawal that happens. Sometimes that withdrawal is when I mess up. Okay? okay? So trust is the currency of relation. Trust is built thread by thread. Think of a rope, and, it's a th and each thread is communication. I want to say that communication is the threads that we, that we thread and we build a rope that can hold tension and, and not break. What happens in the world is cancel culture. You break my trust, well I don't understand how you're acting and so I just cut the rope. Off you go, I, I cut you out of my life. Alright? That model's not working. It's breaking our world even more. Cancer culture. It's like, you mess up, and I cut you out of my life. No, no, no. You act like you don't. You act like, I don't understand, I thought you loved me. You go and fix that. You go and communicate. And that's how you fix it. You communicate it until it's strong again. Because some stuff happens and it wants to set it up. So I want to give you, I want to say trust is the thread built by threads of communication. And I want to give you, in closing, six threads that you can build trust with. For those of you who are fancy about words, and they're all C's. <laughs> Number one, commitment. People are asking, are you, what are you committed to? Can I get on board your mission. And actually they're asking, does that include me? Is your mission bigger, big enough that actually I can come along for the ride? When you're leading people, that's what they're, that's what they're thinking. It's like, are you committed or your vision that you're going after, your mission that you're after, does it include me? Huh? Let me give you a little example. You can run a business and the mission, the sole mission of the business is you committed to your success. Or you, your philosophy can be actually if I give a good service and all my staff are blessed, they do well, that then and we, we are blessing in the community, we are blessing to everyone we come in contact with. That's different. That people can get on board with, but when it's all about you me and myself. Your message, the communication that you send me, what commitment is it? Or what are people reading on the commitment? Number two, character. Your character is the values. It's how you live your life. Uh, very important because we're sending messages by character all the time. I can say I love you and then I do stuff that says I don't love you. You're married, you know about this. Come on. Um, <laughs> I tell her I love her all the time and then I act like I don't love her. Right? Communication. The thread. There's a there's a rub there. Right? Then we've got to have a conversation. And sometimes I've got to explain myself. No, no, really I do. 
<laughs> and sometimes I'm just like, sorry. Most times she's sorry. <laughs> Character. Character is not like. <laughs> Number three, competence. People are asking, can you do the job? Competent. Do you have the goods? Are you able to do the job? So now I'm going to follow this person. Can they do the job? You know what? We don't actually want somebody to be wonderful and perfect at everything. But what we do want is them to be honing their craft. All right? So long as they're getting better, then we are okay to follow them. Right? That's competence. And so if you're leading worship, are you honing your craft? If you're leading a team at work, are you honing your craft? Are you becoming a better leader? Are you learning about leadership? Are you learning about how teams work? Are you learning about how people think? Are you, learning, are you growing your EQ? Does everyone know what EQ is? It's EQ. <laughs> <laughs> we need to teach people about EQ. Like when you walk into the room, open your eyes. What's going on? The two people are talking. Is this a conversation in private? Or is it something that I must just honor them to finish the conversation? That's EQ. It's like, it's, it's, it's really thinking. It's, you're supposed to do it automatically, but sometimes we socially, we don't get it. Right? Competence. Are you honing your crop? Competence is you're communicating something. If you've just plateaued and you've just, you actually haven't got any better at your craft, whatever that is. Consistency. <clears throat> Will you be consistent? Is the question that's being asked. It's hard to trust inconsistency because you're getting mixed messages. I love you, I hate you, I love you, I hate you, I love you, I hate you, I'm for you, I'm not for you. That's inconsistency, that's the message people get. Brings, consistently brings clarity to our communication. Number five, caring. What do you really care about? Do you care about me? Is this just about you? And then finally, centricity. Centricity. Very clever there. Centricity. Not centrality, centricity. You get givers and takers. Who's the center? Is it me or is it us? There are two types of people. Some people live, lead, do everything. It's about me. And other people, it's about us. There's two predominant philosophies in life. The one is, if I look after me, myself, and I, then I'll succeed. The other philosophy is, if I look after everyone else, we will succeed. I'll succeed better. Those are the two. Givers, takers, whatever. Centricity. These are communication threads that you're throwing out all the time to everyone. So here's the challenge. God is raising up a new brand of leader because it's needed. Never in the world's history do I believe that has leadership so been under the under the spotlight because of social media and, and uh, television and all media uh, outlets. Every single mistake, problem, church leaders, world leaders, leaders in school, everything's just under the microscope. And we we need a new brand of leader to stand up. And my, my question is this, will you be part of, and when I say need a lot, you can spoon yourself straight away. Let me just put, throw this one out. Probably half of you when I talk leaders, you think men. And sadly, a lot of the women just excluded themselves from this whole 30 minutes that just went past. Sadly. You know, Romans 12, one of the gifts is leadership. 
God gives a gift of leadership to whom he chooses. And it doesn't say that to, to which man he chooses. Get out of our culture and get into what the Bible says. Who was it? Yes. Uh, yeah, ladies are angry now. <laughs> and if you're a man, just please make sure you lead like this, like the Bible says. Not for your family's sake, for God's sake. We need more than anything men who put people in spaces. We need more than anything men who protect, not harm their families. We need more than anything leaders, men and women, who are passionate about what God has called them to do, who view the role they play in no matter what sphere it's in as a high calling. That's what I want you to respond to. So you you sitting here and you're saying, actually, God's spoken to me today during this message. Please stand. I want to pray for you. Don't stand for me. Stand at your meeting business with God. If you challenge and say, actually, there's some things that I can bring an adjustment. Actually, God's spoken to me. I'm stirred. I'm, I need to change something. Some of my mind shifts. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this brick that we put down as a foundation in this church. This brick of leadership. But I pray that you break every ceiling on people, especially women who have had ceilings put on them. I pray that you break that off. I pray for a release of this new breed of leaders. That people would say yes to you, yes to influencing our world. So let your kingdom come. Lord, would you come as we say yes in bowing our knee to you, would you come behind us and empower and and, and, and um, anoint and enable us to do the tasks that you're wanting us to do so that we can do it for you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.